It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing orthodontist Lynn Hurst, who was born in Corpus Christi in 1957, the middle of three children, to Reverend Chester Olive Hurst and Dorothy May uh, Hurst. Um, he graduated from A.C. Jones High School in Beeville, Texas, where four out of five of my grandchildren lived. In 1975, and Southwestern uh, University, Georgetown, Texas, in 79, with a B.A. in biology, minor in chemistry. In 1984, he received his doctor of dental surgery with honors on uh, um, Omicron Kappa Epsilon, you can know I didn't get it because I can't even pronounce it, from the University <laughs> of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. In 86, he received a specialty certificate in orthodontics and dental facial peaks from the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center. So um, I wonder if he's a uh, Texas football fan or Oklahoma. Upon completion of his education in 86, he entered private practice in San Antonio, uh, where Scott Loon practices, right? So where he practiced orthodontics uh, for 20 years. After one year in practice, he joined the faculty of the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio and has been involved in orthodontic education and research ever since. Uh, Dr. Hirsch completed phase three of board certification in orthodontics um, and achieving the status of diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics in 2003 was one of only 30 orthodontists to be recertified as a diplomat. I mean, his resume goes on forever and ever and ever. And in uh, 2007, he accepted the position as professor and founding dean for the College of Dental Medicine at Roseman University. That's in Salt Lake City, right? Salt Lake City and a campus in uh, Henderson, Nevada. Henderson, Nevada. In 2008, the College of Dental Medicine began the inaugural postdoctoral dental program, Advanced Education Orthodontics and Dental Facial Orthopedics, Master's of Business Administration Residency Program, an innovative and first doctoral dental program to combine dental specialty training with an MBA degree. In 2011, the College of Dental Medicine launched the pre-doctoral dental program initiated under Dr. Hurst's leadership. In 2010, Dr. Hurst returned to Texas to be closer to, he says his family, but I'm sure it was my grandchildren, and founded <laughs> Texas Orthodontics. In January 2016, Dr. Hurst and Texas Orthodontics implemented its proprietary, innovative, integrative clear aligner system ranging from digital orthodontic records, to comprehensive diagnosis and treatment planning, to bioengineering dental digital treatment, to monitoring treatment compliance and progress, to measuring treatment outcomes, and into into uh, post treatment retention, um, positioning Texas Orthodontics as the first exclusively clear aligner orthodontic practice transitioning from analog orthodontic braces to digital orthodontics clear aligners. Um, teledentistry, teleorthodontics is the next frontier in dental medicine. In 2017, Dr. Hurst co-founded Candid, um, Candid, you know, like being straightforward, straight teeth, uh, Candid, C-A-N-D-I-D, -D, as chief dental officer to help usher in the first orthodontist-directed teledentistry, teleorthodontics, healthcare dental services organization with a mission to provide accessible, affordable, quality, and safe oral health care to everyone who desires a beautiful, healthy smile. Dr. Hurst's early research interest was in biomaterials. Currently, his interest is in practice-based research networks and clinical trials, and he has several peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Hurst is a member of numerous professional organizations. The list is too long to read. In his spare time, he enjoys... Automobiles, footballs, movies, off-road, motorcycle, on and on and on. I wanted to get you on the show so bad. Um, the biggest, anything new is the most controversial. I mean, you know how humans want everything the same. How they'd be driving Fred Flintstone car uh, if they if they could still have it. But my gosh, um, orthodontics is. Um, it's it's one of the most changing professions. You saw Smiles Direct Club do an IPO, and that went over like a lead balloon in church. There's lawsuits everywhere. Um, so let, let's just start there. Um, what did you, I, and in my lifetime, I, I got to start there. When I lecture around the world, um, my gosh, it, once you tell someone you're a dentist, first question out of their mouth is Invisalign. And it's like when I started lecturing around the world in night in the nineteen uh, early nineties, the big brands were Colgate, Crest, and Listerine, and all that stuff. And then Invisalign comes out of nowhere, takes complete mind share. If you go to Vietnam or you go anywhere on Earth and say you're a dentist, that the waitress says, 
You do Invisalign? Uh, and then the Smiles Direct Club, the teledentistry thing. I don't even know where to start, but let's start with the Smiles Direct Club IPO because uh, you're a founder of Candid. That very well may likely could do an IPO someday. I mean, I don't know. I, um, uh, but what, what did you think of Smiles Direct Club? Well, c- Candid in, in, uh, in many ways is really a, uh, an offshoot of the Smile Direct Club um, concept. In my own practice in 2015, late 2015, 2016, I, had, I moved completely to uh, clear liners. And the reason was I needed to find out how far can we go with this tool as an orthodontist. So when you take the crutch of braces away, you find out really quick what kind of training wheels you need and what it's going to take for you to be able to treat every case uh, with clear aligners. So when I started that journey, uh, it was bumpy. I was actually doing it with uh, Invisalign. Uh, What I learned during that time is that I learned what the weaknesses were of uh, Align technology or the Invisalign product. Uh, in my opinion, they uh, we, you know they, they they push a lot of things that make uh, that are proprietary to them attachments. They ask dentists and orthodontists to do a lot of IPR. Uh, I'm not a big fan of either one of those. So anyway, I, through that journey, uh, then uh, you know Smile Direct Club came along, and. Uh, and I was interested in having an orthodontist only version of that uh, because as a specialist, um, I, I and, and as an academic individual, uh, I, I think that there are certain uh, people who have the, the proper training to do certain procedures. Um, you know, in school, there were two things I didn't like. Uh, well, I didn't like blood for one. That's the reason I went into dental medicine and turned out that there was blood in dental medicine. So that created a problem for me. Um, uh, endodontic treatment was, was not something that got my attention. Um, extraction of, uh, third molars didn't get my attention. I did, I hated periodontal, uh, surgery. It was way too bloody. And uh, when, you know, when it came to growth and development, that seemed to be something that stimulated my mind. So going, you know, again, going back to Smile Direct Club, Candid is, is really an, uh, is intended to be, let the specialist deal with a challenging uh, space of, tele, of telemedicine, teledentistry. And uh, we've got a great, uh, a great core of uh, orthodontists that that work with with uh with our patients and um you know and it's and it's been it's been a fun journey i i, I always like stepping out and doing things a, a little bit uh different than have been done in the past what what i have found out is that in order to really address and i learned this in academics to address the access uh issue access to care you can't keep doing things the same way and expect access to care to follow. It's not, it's not going to happen. So you have to change models about how you provide care. What, you know, what we were, what we were looking at doing at all of the universities I've been involved in is creating opportunities back into the community so that we can build networks of, of professional colleagues to help us, brainstorm and figure out ways to do this. Candid is just one of those things where we're using, using modern technology uh, to, to really um, open up this access to care issue. And, and we know in the brick and mortar stores what all the fixed costs are. And if you maintain that model, you're, you, at some point, you you you're limited as to where you can bring your price point down. So you have to change. You have to kind of turn that upside down, and that's what that's what we're doing. So, what year did you get out of ortho school? I got out of. The, I, I completed my residency in uh, in 1986. Okay, so 1986, you're an orthodontist, and it was uh, not even about 10 years. It was 97 when Zia Christie. Uh, started a line technology. Um, um, and now, isn't all those patents kind of expiring? Isn't that 
Uh, yes, the majority of his patents are expiring. Is that what's opening up this? Because you see a plethora of all these clear liner companies. Is that because was Zia the the guy that actually invented it? Was he? Zia Zia was a graduate student at Stanford. Not had nothing to do with uh, dentistry, and um, and he uh, he and you know one of his colleagues they started thinking about you know some innovations and they you know they came up with this idea of of getting impressions and getting these models and you know we we as dentists were kind of doing it you know old school way um i remember my students and even when i was in my residency we'd get a model and then we'd have to we'd have to section all the teeth out like we were doing a, you know, we were going to do a dye for a crown or something, and then we would move them around and use wax to, to fill them in. He 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 just took he just took the technology that was available at that time and built it into a kind of a digital format, and you know it, it's 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 sad, but a lot of times some of the innovations in our profession come from people who who have a different lens on. And they just see things that we kind of get buried in in the weeds because we as uh, oral health care providers, we're very detail oriented people. And um, sometimes we have to, you know, we have to force ourselves to back up a little bit and look at the big picture. Uh, and, I, and I find myself having to do that often. Wow. Um, and and it's also um, not, not only do people make all these innovations from um, um, that weren't even from orthodontics or dentists, but um, then they're also uh, immigrants. He, he was from Pakistan. And mm-hmm. it, it's just amazing when you look at all these IEPOs in Silicon Valley. It, it's kind of like when the Boston, uh, when Boston won the, the, the Stanley Cup. Uh, it was so interesting that not one of their players was even born in the United States. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's always like when the, everybody, Americans always tell you that America went to the moon. Yeah, with a bunch of stolen scientists from Germany after World War II. I'm pretty sure that the people who got us to the moon, not one of them spoke English. They were all German-speaking physicists. But yeah, American went to the moon. Boston won the Stanley Cup. Uh, but the, um, So would you say Zia started the, the, uh, the genre of clear aligners? But does does yeah, he get credited he, for starting clear aligners? Yeah, he, he he's he's that he's the he's the original founder of uh, Align Technology, which is the company behind Invisalign. So yeah, he's the he's uh, you know our history books are going to show that uh, not Edward Hartley Engel or Pierre Fouchard, uh, were, you know, were the great innovators of clear aligners. It was uh, it was someone that wasn't even a dentist. That will go down in the history books. Now, since, since that particular time, you know, in our, my profession of dental medicine as a whole really kind of rejected this up front myself. I, I mean, I started treating patients with it uh, and it was horrible. And it was horrible because I was horrible. Uh, the technology was horrible. And we were, you know, we were still trying to implement the exact same um you know, uh, movement, uh, techniques that we use with bands and brackets when, cause when you take a, a bracket, it's away from the tooth and then you put a wire in it, you have to apply couples and, and a bunch of other different forces in order to move the root the way you want to. That's the way we were trained. Well, uh, it actually, you have to kind of unwind that. And when you put clear plastic over a tooth, you, your tooth now becomes the bracket. And so you got to think of the tooth as the bracket and you now apply forces to that tooth that you need to do in order to move it around. So in some ways it's easier, but it's, you just have to kind of rethink the process and um, clear liners, uh, quite frankly, I don't think were of a significant penetration in the market or to general dentists or to orthodontists. Um, up until the intraoral scanner came along in about 10 to 2011, 12, t- t- in that area, when we got to where we could get a digital scan of the teeth, we then started getting aligners that fit uh, much better. And, uh, and that was, that's kind of where things have taken off. Going back to your previous question, the uh, 11 of the foundational patents for align technology expired and these were kind of 
again, they were they were the building block from all of their other patents. That has opened up a floodgate of of opportunities. And, there, you know, there's a good reason our country has this kind of the 17 year head start window for someone to develop some technology because there's a lot of research and development that goes into that. Uh, but what, you know, Align Technology took this very aggressive approach and I mean, they, they just went after anyone who, who came into their territory and uh, you know, and I, my, my personal opinion there, there's going to be a price to pay for that. And uh, not just in the market, but from the, from the dentists who were kind of under that thumb uh, and creativity was kind of stymied there for that window of time. So right now there's a plethora of things going on that are just, you know, all over the place. Every major company in dentistry is uh, coming up with their version of this. Uh, can, Candid is in, like, in, in summary, is is really a teledentistry DSO, and we're we're doing the exact same things that I did in my office. We're just doing them in a telemedicine, teledentistry manner, uh, or they can come into one of our studios. And the studio is very similar to an office experience. So, in summary, of Smiles Direct Club, they tried to uh, bypass a doctor. They, 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 do you think that was their biggest mistake is that they, uh, like, because when you look at Invisalign, I mean, they they, they court orthodontists. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. they have a big relationship with orthodontists. Would you say that was Smiles Direct's biggest problem was that they tried to bypass the orthodontists and go around them? Uh, you know, I, I, I can't get into their minds and I don't know enough about them to be very... Uh, intellectually critical, but th- you know they they have taken a little bit of an adversarial approach to the, to, to, the, to the dental profession, and I can tell you, Candid is a hundred and eighty degrees away from that. It just, we it, feel it just. It, I don't know to interrupt you, but it, it's so insane. I mean, healthcare is seventeen percent of the U.S. economy. That means seventeen cents of every dollar. It's the most. Healthcare is the biggest, most entrenched. It's regulated from 50 states, 50 different state boards. And that guy's strategy was to start attacking and suing dentists and dental boards. I mean, yeah, you'd have yeah. to be dilute. Delu- I mean, you're not going to see me go to the, the Phoenix Zoo and say, let me in the cage with those lions. I'll show them a, a, you know, who's boss around here. I mean, to go, yeah. I mean, it, it was just crazy. I, I don't, I don't know how, we're, maybe he'll show me wrong, but. I just wouldn't have attacked 17% of the U.S. economy uh, if, unless yeah. I really had to. But so, so, so what if someone said, well, what's the difference between Candid and um, Smiles Direct Club or Invisalign? What, what would be, sure. if I was Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank, um, <laughs> isn't that filmed in Dallas? Yeah, yes. So yes. pretend we're in Dallas and I'm going to be the beautiful Mr. Bald Wonderful from Canada. Um, he would say, um, what, what, what is unique about you? First thing he's going to want is, do you have any IP protection? You just said that all of Zia stuff. So Mr. Wonderful is going to tell, uh, make me, um, make Mr. Wonderful happy right now. Well, one thing you're better looking than he is, but I will still <laughs> do my best to try to make that happen. Um, uh, c- c- candid, uh, initially was again, a, a an orthodontist, uh, rebuttal to, what we feel in my specialty is we, you know, we've kind of uh, sometimes we feel like uh, maybe a stepchild in that we've we've kind of been uh, pushed out of um, you know pretty much all that we do and and, and history is going to say that there's some probably some good reasons why we have we've done that. However, as an orthodontist who is used to working with my colleagues because that's what we do. We work hand in hand with our our our, our dent, general dental colleagues. We work with other specialists every day, all day long in our practice. So you know, for us to come into this space and want to uh, punch everybody in the face, that's just not that's not in our DNA. Our DNA is to be part of the team. And back when you and I were in dental school, um, 
it was we were always taught that the general dentist is the quarterback of the team and you know the 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 endodontist and the periodontist and the orthodontist and the oral surgeon and the pediatric dentist and the prosthodontist everyone has a role to play in providing great care so the first thing i would say is that i wanted to choose my colleagues who are specialists and let's uh, let's approach teledentistry and do just what we do in our practices using the tools and the technology of teledentistry. That, that's really what we did. For, for example, when uh, whether it's a patient at home or a patient who comes into our studio, the first thing we do is a notice of privacy practices. We develop that doctor-patient relationship and we get a, a, a thorough medical dental history and a, a, a beginning of the informed consent that so that they understand what relationship they're getting into. We all agree that that's the standard of care. The, the next thing we'll do is that uh, we will get a, an eight series photo, individual photos that end up in a collage. And it's what we as orthodontists call the American Board of Orthodontics. So when we go show cases or we go and sit before the board for certification, it's a, it's a standardized format, three extra oral photos and five intra oral photos that we will present uh, that we pr present to our orthodontists so that for, for the for them to be able to diagnose and treatment plan if they're at home they'll get a PBS impression and, and what what one of the things I'm very proud of we now can get photos from patients through the technologies that we have uh, that will rival what you can get in your private practice and I'm going to tell you it wasn't easy but with a lot of hard work and a lot of smart people, we figured out how to get those photos. And I'll put, I'll put, I'll put our, 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 our records up against anyone. The next step is at, at home is the PBS impression. Okay. Now, getting a PBS, a good PBS, a full mouth PBS impression in an office is a challenge. Another thing I'm proud of is the ability through our training tools and, uh, you know, through uh, a lot of hard work by a lot of people in, 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 not me, just a bunch of people and through trials and tests and, and studies, we figured out how to get a, a really good PVS impression from our patients who don't have access to an office or to a studio. Okay. In the studio, it's simple. We, you know, we, 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 we get the photos, uh, by trained people, we get the intraoral scans, and that you know those come those come great. Uh, the next thing we're rolling out right now is uh, getting digital ready, uh, digital X-rays uh, in the studio here in Austin, where I live. We have an X-ray machine, so we're operationalizing that. We think that that um, while there are some cases that it may not require having an X-ray, we want our patients to always have that option uh, in, in treatment. And, uh, but it, it, so anyway, so we go, we, 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 we go through and we, we do all those things. That information is put together, it's sent to the orthodontist and the orthodontist at that point can make a decision of go or no go basically in treatment. Is the patient, someone that we can treat in our space or is it someone who has to be referred back to a general dentist and second has to be maybe uh, might need to be referred to an orthodontist because of the severity of the malocclusion doesn't fit in our model and I, when I say model I'll be very careful here our current pricing model it's not that we can't treat them it's that we can't treat them at the price point that because we only have one price point right now, so that's well, what we what, do. What does that mean? There's a lot of kids listening to this middle school. What, what do you mean you only have one price point? We only have we, it's nineteen hundred bucks. Okay, it's and so nineteen hundred bucks. When you look at, at our in our business model, when you take the cost of the aligners, the cost of marketing, all those things, and you put everything together, just like you would in your office. There's only so many sets of aligners that, that we can use right now in that price, in the, in, in that model of $1,900. Now <clears throat> I, from the beginning, just like I did in practice, I always had different price points for my patients. 
I would have kind of the basic care and then I would have kind of the metal package because you can call it the bronze, silver and gold package for treatment. Um, I think that that's always important to give the patient those options. At this point, we we only have the bronze package. Um, again, I don't run the company. Um, I encourage as an orthodontist and as chief dental officer that we provide uh, more robust choices for, for our patients, but that's not where we're at right now. Okay, so it, when that information is sent to the orthodontist, they make a decision about can we treat them or not treat them. Uh, right now, I can tell you that our numbers that are right at the 25%, one of every four people who come to us, we have to send them back for dental care or we have to send them, refer them to an orthodontist because it's something that we're, we're not um, at the point that we can treat them. So, so that's, that, I mean, that's what we do. And then after that, we go through the process of getting the, the 3D STL file converted into segmented, and we then design the treatment. And that treatment then is reviewed by our orthodontist, again, with the other diagnostic records. And then we make a decision about, uh, you know, do we need to revise that treatment plan? Uh, or is that treatment plan good? Once we've approved the treatment plan, it goes back to the patient and the patient has a chance to review that and make a decision. Is, is it going to give them the outcome uh, that, they, that they are looking for? Uh, and as we know, we know being dentists, that the first thing, question we always ask is, what's the chief complaint? So if the patient comes in and they say, <clears throat> I have TMD problems, uh, or what they always call it TMJ. I have TMJ. Okay, well, that's probably not going to be a patient that I'm going to want to step into because we know that that is such a multifactorial uh, area. You know, the, the diagnosis and the treatment plan, it's all over the place. It may not have anything to do with orthodontics. So I, as an orthodontist, I'm not comfortable treating those patients uh, just, just because I may – open up a can of worms that there's something else going on that I, that I may not want to get into. Okay. In my practice, I had no problems uh, dealing with that because those patients require a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, communication. So anyway, we use that and we, uh, if the patient uh, approves treatment, we manufacture the aligners and we uh, you know, and then we, we send them to them. We have a, a day one check-in with them. We're now moving into technologies where I can actually get a visual uh, scan of my patient's teeth and how they're tracking in the aligners every 10 days. So I actually can see my patients more in teledentistry than I did in my own private practice. So um, it's, it's, uh, th there's, there, there's, there's just so many opportunities out there for us to provide uh affordable, accessible, uh, high quality and safe care to, to patients that are just a little bit out of the, the traditional model. So you, so basically the do, so would you say that like, um, smiles direct club and crystal braces are more do it yourself, D I Y do it yourself, uh, dental offices that really, um, and you're trying to loop in the orthodontist. I mean, is that would that be the clear differentiator? Yeah. I, again, I'm, I have to be cautious about speaking for other companies because I don't know really where where right. they're at because I'm not internal with them. All I know is that for us, yes, the, it is orthodont. It's not just doctor directed. It's orthodontist directed, personalized care throughout the the journey of treatment. Many of our patients will get. You know, as as I don't know if you practice with if you you do any clear aligner treatment, but if you do, oftentimes you don't get it in the first set of aligners, so you have to go back for a refinement uh, and do additional treatment. Uh, we, we we as orthodontists know that that's that's going to happen, and and we provide that uh, care to our patients. Now we do ask them to be uh, just like I did in practice. If I give a patient a simple case. Uh, clear liners and they don't wear them as prescribed, I'm probably not going to get the outcome that uh, either one of us uh, want. And is there any more or less compliance between boys and girls? I mean, I, I just can't understand. I, I can't imagine that the average uh, um, boy in high school in Texas 
would wear his clear liners uh, when he's been wearing the same Texas A&M shirt for three days in a row. Do you have any more um, compliance for all of the boys or girls or not really? The, the, the only compliance problem I have with teenage boys is not that they don't wear them. It's that they don't take them out to clean them because once they put it in, they're like so thankful that they don't have braces on. They're like, if they ever take them out that this, uh, you know, this gift from up above or wherever is going to disappear. And, uh, it's, th- th- there's, there's a big, uh, there's a big chasm between parents and the understanding of their children, particularly the males. If the males want it for some reason, they will do anything. If they don't want it, it just happens that most of my male pa- teen, adolescent patients, they actually want the clear aligners. If they don't want them, what you said is 100% true. It's going to be it's going to be a train wreck. So how do you, um, it, it's so tough. On, on the one hand, you want innovation. You want everything to go uh, faster, easier, higher quality, smart. I mean, this, this whole country, especially America, there's some. <laughs> There's something in the secret sauce about American entrepreneurism. I mean, really, it's the largest economy in the world. How do you draw the line with the orthodontist who, like dentists, um, they're not, they don't like change? Um, how you're a board certified orthodontist in Texas, which isn't a liberal state. I mean, that that is a very conservative state. Uh, when I go down there to Beeville, I mean, I mean, uh, shout out to uh, uh, Tim Rainey and all those guys down there, but. How did this go over with a bunch of redneck conservative orthodontists in Texas? I mean, are you are do you have any well, wounds you can show me or you, you know what? I I I have uh, I have a bodyguard and I wear a, a flap jacket. So I'm in and I'm in a special witness protection program. So, so are, are I, you in there with Scott Loon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah, other no, Texas the renegade. Bodyguard. We have the same bodyguard. <laughs> we have the same bodyguard. Uh, but no, it's 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 not. I mean, my colleagues, when I first started approaching them about this, they're like, Dr. Hurst, we thought you were crazy and you're officially crazy. So uh, but again, as you talk through the 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 taboos and the norms and and you un- and they understand really what we're going to do. OK, we're not do, we're not doing quackery and we're not we're not about trying to do something that's not already uh, proven that it can work. Or, I mean, there, there's there's still 80 percent of my orthodontic colleagues who don't even think clear liners work. So for them, it's a very tough conversation for the orthodontist who have treated a lot of patients with clear liners and understand the pitfalls and the challenges and the workarounds and in, in, in how you design the case. Um, th- then it starts to make sense. But, you know, as, as we in, in the world of dentistry, uh, particularly in orthodontics, we, 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 I'll take my last 10 cases that I've treated in anybody who's listening, you bring your last 10 cases and, and you know what, and let's just put it on the table and let's see who, who can do it. Um, I don't care if you do it with braces or do it with clear liners. So it's, a comparison I always look at is Michael Jordan and I can both be handled handed the same basketball. The things that he can do with that basketball are, are intimidating to what I could do with that basketball. It's the same basketball. So what I like to think of, it's not the basketball. It's not the clear liner. It's the doctor it's the knowledge, it's the wisdom, it's the experience behind the scenes that makes someone uh, an expert or excellent at what they do. Doesn't necessarily make them any smarter, it just makes them the expert. I, in 2019, can do pretty much anything with clear liners that I could ever do with brackets and bands in traditional orthodontic. Okay, and that's I'm not saying that to, to brag, I'm just saying, I put in the energy and the effort to figure it out and it's not easy, but it's possible. And if you tell me it's not possible and you've never done it, or you've only done a hundred or a thousand of them, then that's doesn't really have much weight to me because it takes a lot of mistakes 
to get it right. And we as dentists know that because that's why my mom, God bless her, God rest her soul, up until she passed away, she kept asking me in Beeville, Texas, every time I would visit her, son, you've been in this profession for a long time. Why do they say you're still practicing? <laughs> it was a good question, okay? Because that's what we do all the time. We practice. Every day, we learn something that we didn't know the day before so that we can get a little bit better the next day. So I think we all just need to keep practicing, and every day, we're going to get a little bit better. You know, we, t- we started off talking and, uh, about Zia, who started this clear aligner deal, and you were saying that you, that you have patients that are so glad they're not all branded up. Um, uh, there was another orthodontist back in the 50s, um, uh, Dr. Craven Kurtz, who invented invisible braces uh, in Beverly Hills by going with lingual uh, braces. <laughs> is lingual braces still a thing, or is that... Um, is that really not a thing? I mean, I mean, it, it, the few times I run into it, the issue was their tongue would play with it until their tongue was hamburger. Um, yeah. is lingual, yeah. you know, they don't want people to see, uh, their, 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 their braces. Uh, is lingual braces still a thing? There is still, there are still several societies. M- most of the lingual orthodontics is going on in Europe or in outside of the United States, quite frankly. Um, and maybe that's because clear aligners have not penetrated uh, the market in the same way as it has here in the U.S. But my experience, you know, I'm a young orthodontist. I get out. Uh, Vince Kelly, who was one of the th- first 3M guys who was involved in the in the lingual orthodontics, was one of my instructors at at, at, at Oklahoma. And I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to do this. Well, first of all, I wasn't a very good orthodontist with uh, brackets on the facial of the teeth, so I'm not so sure what I thought I was going to be great about putting them on the inside of the mouth. And uh, And then I realized why I had become an orthodontist because you're upside down, working upside down in their mouth, trying to put these brackets and put a wire in there. It was, it was very difficult. I abandoned it in favor of clear brackets, which was problematic in and of itself. Uh, And the reason was though the patient complaint, if you put lingual on the upper and lower, Many patients can tolerate the lingual on the upper, but when you consume tongue space on the lower, uh, it got really ugly. And so I I would have patients that were just like, you know what, you got to take these off. So for a season, I did lingual on the upper and uh, and, and facial brackets or buckle brackets on the lower, traditional brackets on the lower. But there's a small segment of the population who is still doing that. But I mean, it's, you can, it's in the hundreds. It's just not very many people, particularly in, with clear aligners around. Yeah. So, um, so there's so many, um, if someone asked you, well, what is the unique selling proposition? I mean, I, I, I don't know how many there are, but I mean, there's, uh, uh, there's candid smiles, direct club, snap crack, smile love, crystal braces from home, dental, easy smile, dental lab directs in, in Texas. Uh, they're, mm-hmm. they're in Dallas or orthly. Um, what, what do you say? What would you say to Mr. Wonderful who said, what is your unique selling proposition than this other long list? Well, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to a quality outcome in whatever that takes. So in, uh, in my private practice in San Antonio, uh, something that my parents always taught me, my, my dad in particular he was like, son, whatever you choose to do, just do one thing and be the best at it. Okay. Well, I don't know if I'm the best at it, but I've always tried to follow that, that MO. Uh, and so in whatever I've done in private practice, I always wanted to have the nicest office. I always wanted to have the best team around me because we in practice know that that's ultimately our success and, and, and or our failures can come from there. And then I wanted to be high tech. So I wanted to use, I wanted to use technology. I remember when I started my practice in San Antonio, I had an IBM XT and it had a 64 K Ram, 64 K Ram. I mean, there are, I, there's nothing that I even know of anymore that runs on that little Ram. 
So I was like, okay, I need to network this. So I put slave cards in the, uh, and that's probably not an appropriate term these days, but they, they called them slave cards at that time. They were, they were PCI boards that you would snap in and you could make a connection and make a network. Uh, I loaded an Excel spreadsheet one time that was so big, it consumed all of the RAM and it just froze up the computer that was running my whole office. So that, you know, there's, there's, if you do that in any space that you go into, you're committed to take care of your patients. You're committed to take care of your team. Uh, th that's really the candid model. We, we have great support. We want to make sure that our patients, uh, we're, we're not perfect, but we're in, and we, but we are certainly in search of not perfection, but excellence in, in the care of the patients from how their teeth are aligned, how they fit together to how they are, uh, addressed in communications. And I think that those are the things that are currently differentiating us and that ultimately, uh, will will be what brands us as candid. So when you're learning braces, um, well, well first of all, it, it, orthodontics is different because, I mean, endodontists do uh, the majority of molar, I mean, do molar endo, but dentists do some, um, you know, dentists, general dentists do some, and specialists do uh, anywhere from, you know, the most difficult to a lot. What do, what is the general thoughts of orthodontists? There's 10,800 of them in America. What do they think of when it, they see a dentist doing uh, a clear liner case? Gen orthodontists uh, generally don't think general dentists should be doing any orthodontic treatment, okay? Now, I, I, I will differ a little bit there because I have worked with and known some general dentists who have made the commitment and the dedication to really figure this stuff out in, in lieu of having the formal training. They, they've spent the time. And uh, in, in, in some cases, I've had some general dentists who were better at orthodontics than some of my own colleagues. Now, that's not the case if you look at the if you look at, at everyone, that's not the case because it's very difficult in a general dental practice to jump from endo to extractions to uh, a, a, a class one a carious uh, a prep and, and restoration over to a uh, a pediatric patient jumping over to a patient in braces. And the, the reason that that is challenging is that as you build your orthodontic patient population within your own practice, the chair time in traditional braces is very, is very loaded and the return on dollars isn't there. So it's better for the general dentist uh, from an economic standpoint to do that unless they're really going to focus on it and it's a very big part of their practice. So just to blend it in that, that, that those chair dollars are very low compared to almost every other procedure that they do. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not against it. I just want, if you're a general dentist and you are going to do it, invest the energy and the time to figure it out, uh, and provide excellent care in that, uh, it means that you need to, you need to monitor your treatments in the beginning through treatment. And, uh, at the end, you, the only way that we learn is to look at what we did at the end and then we assess ourselves. And that's the definition of a professional. You don't need somebody looking over your shoulder to tell you that you need to get better. Your education and your perseverance and your continual um, desire to understand your 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 trade, your profession, is really what makes you an expert. And anyone in our profession who chooses that path can be very successful in whatever they choose to do. But you 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 you're just not going to be great at everything. Okay, the next six questions I'm going to ask are kind of going to be clinical in nature. Let's start. You know, records. Diagnosis and treatment planning, uh, the treatment, 
uh, monitoring treatment, uh, measuring treatment outcomes, and then post-treatment retention. But let's start with digital orthodontic record. record. This is dentistry on sensor. We like to talk about what's the most controversial. Some people are saying that CBCT is the standard of care. Other people are saying, no, it's not. Some people are saying, well, you should do it if you can. Um, we've had two oral radiologists on the show saying she doesn't like the amount of uh, radiation compared to a pano. And she's also, she's seen way too much of people getting CBCTs without thyroid collars on. Um, so my first question is, is CBCT standard of care in ortho in 2019? No, absolutely not. Um, the, the, the challenge, the, the, the radiologist that you spoke with, because when I was in academics, I was a big proponent of pushing CBCT uh, in dental medicine, not just orthodontics, but in dental medicine. However, as, as we started to look at the amount of radiation, uh, to get a volume image, to get a high quality volume image, because what you're doing is you're getting three dimensional images and then you're extracting and looking at two dimensional images most of the time. So if you can get a, a panoramic x ray uh, and uh, or a cephalometric x ray, or you can get periapicals and bite wings and you can do it at a lower dose of radiation, and you're not using the three-dimensional features of the cone beam CT, it's con to me, it's contraindicated because of the amount of radiation versus the uh, what, what you're looking at. If you're taking a 3D image and you're only reviewing 2D images, that makes no sense uh, to me for the patient. So I would, when I talk about digital radiography, uh, or, or digital records, I'm talking about digital photos, uh, two, two, primarily two-dimensional uh, uh, x-rays, and, and then you can, you can then take the, uh, the scan of the teeth and get a three-dimensional model out of that. So, you know, you can, you, you can actually articulate them. You can make them look like, you know, the, what orthodontists, you know, look like plaster models. Um, you can put them on an articulator if you want to. You can do all that. It's basically putting everything in ones and zeros so that you can re review all this stuff in front of a nice monitor and computer and so that you have instant access to all of your patients' records. That's what I'm talking about in digital uh, radiography. But I'm I'm I've backed off of my I'm 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 a little bit more skeptical. What what we did in academics, we would take the three dimensional model and then and then we would send that to a radiologist for them to review it because at that point. Uh, there was some concerns about the dentist was going to be liable for things that we weren't looking at. And, uh, and so you, you add all of those things to it, you're just increasing the cost of care. And if you're not looking at anything that's three-dimensional, I, 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 I just don't think that that's the, that's the right tool. Um, if someone, um, it seems like I, I, I podcast a couple hundred orthodontists. seems like, Almost everybody says they're it's the 80-20 rule. They're 80% fixed wire, 20% um, clear liner. Uh, you, and uh, there's another guy in Canada, or 100%. Um, why, why do you think the majority of orthodontists are still 80-20 clear liner? And why, they're, why are, is there a couple of people like you that are more all clear liner? Uh, the, the only rationale I've come to is uh, they, they don't want to, they don't want to take the training wheels off and figure out some of these nuanced tooth movements that uh, are are a little bit more of a challenge. Now, if you if you uh, subscribe to everything that uh, Align Technology or Invisalign tells you, there are a number of limitations, particularly relative to extrusive movements and the, the and the excessive need for attachments. Uh, and that's because part of that's in part because they have a scallop cut and that scallop cut does not grab the tooth. Remember in removable partial dentures, what we learned is the only way you're going to get this partial denture to stay in the mouth is what? Undercuts. We, in fact, we would even go in and we would remove some of the, the tooth either on the patient or 
on the plaster so that we could get those little clasps to fit in under there and lock in. So, you know, when you're moving teeth, it's the same thing. You got to grab it. I don't have a bracket now, so I have to use my tooth as the bracket. And that's, it's, it's just, it's just comfort level. They, they, you know, they fall back on the comfort of what they know to do with bands and brackets. So what percent of your practice, I mean, you, um, you're the clinical director of Candid mm -hmm. and you own Texas Orthodontics, right? No, I'm no, I'm no longer in private practice. I, I, okay. I, so you're I, no longer with Texas Orthodontics. I'm no longer with, I, 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 I sold the assets of Texas Orthodontics, um, uh, back in 2017. Okay. My bad. I am sorry for, uh, giving that mis misinformation. Uh, but I'm glad I, I know. Um, but by the way, a lot of people, um, when you say, well, you ought to write that for an article on Dental Town or you ought to post that on social media, you ought to come by. They're so afraid to say, ah, you know, I'm afraid it might be wrong. You know, I've had a monthly column since 1994. And of course, um, I've uh, started my own magazine because no one else had published me. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it's funny, what everybody is afraid of, I always enjoyed the most. I mean, you could be wrong in something and all these... <laughs> people for free volunteers editing your incorrect thought and sending you a letter or a phone call. I remember one time I was in, doing a, working on a patient. This is back in like 94, 95. And uh, some, uh, they come back in my office and they said, there's some dentist on the phone in your office. He says it's urgent. I went back there and he, and I said, hello, this is Howard. And he goes, uh, he goes, uh, what did he say? It was, uh, um, oh, who was the, I, uh, not Eisenhower, in World War II, who was the big general? Patton. Patton. He goes, Patton was not a five-star general, you idiot. He was a four-star general. Eisenhower was a five-star. Uh, and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> you know, it was about dentistry. But it was so funny because, like, I'll never, ever forget that Patton was only a four-star general. So, so when you're wrong, people, it's just so nice um, to say all your thoughts. So if you're thinking something uh, incorrectly... Uh, so, someone's gonna, gonna, gonna tell you about, it. but I, I'm gonna go to a separate deal. It seems like I've been doing this 32 years. I'm 57 years old. It seems like whenever I talk to a patient about orthodontics, who's in, um, in, um, you know, under 25, they're like, do I need braces? Am I going to get braces? But man, whenever you're talking to anybody, my old, my age, they've already had ortho a couple of times. Their, their only thought is retention. It, it yeah. seems like seems like everybody thinks orthodontics is this really neat thing, but it seems like I've seen a lot of people who've had ortho two or three times in in high school and when they first got married because then they, they go back the the big surge in Invisalign and all that is when you're back on the market and you go post your picture on uh, uh, <laughs> Tinder so or Plenty of Fish. Did you, I put my picture up on Plenty of Fish and they took it down. They said, dude, you're a whale. You're not a fish. And uh, they said, lose 50 pounds and resubmit it. But the bottom line is when these ladies and men are coming back on and they're, they're now on the market, they, they had braces in grammar school. They had braces in their 20s. And these young dentists that are getting an ortho, I tell them all the time, I said, Straightening the tooth is the easy part. Retaining oh, yeah. is much harder. Do, yeah. do, do you think, what do you think is harder, straightening or retaining? Retaining. Oh, yeah. Retaining Reta for and, sure. And how many, how many ladies have you met in your life that by 60 had had braces three times? It, yes. It's, it's uh, you know, I had, again, it's a, a good thing I'm not in private practice anymore because it's probably politically incorrect. But I, I would always tell my patients, children, adolescents, adults. Okay, here's the dirty little secret of orthodontics. Retention is forever. So here's our agreement. You're gonna have to wear your retainer until I die or you die, because one <laughs> of us has to exit, because that's the only way that we're gonna get closure on this thing, because the teeth are always moving. And, you know, in, in you know, I went through a phase about 10 years where I put permanent retainers uh, on my patients because I got tired of them coming back and they didn't wear their retainers. I stopped that because 
then the general dentist and the hygienist were saying, you know what, these patients aren't taking care of these permanent retainers and they're getting some gingival recession and their, their hygiene isn't great. There's some periodontal concerns. And I was like, oh my Lord. And then, you know, fortunately what came along because I was talking about the old plastic ones and I still have mine with the wire that came around, the little loops and stuff like that. When we got to wear clear aligners and I saw that patients uh, would we, we would use the Essex retainers for you know for it looked like a clear liner for retention. They did really didn't complain about those. Uh, the problem was they were so rigid that if they didn't wear them like their wire and plastic ones, there they put it in after about two or three days and their eyes would cross. So now we have some little softer materials. Uh, I don't know you 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 still remember the tooth positioners? Orthodontists went through this. You would just give them this big mouth guard at the end, and they had to chew in it four hours a day, and uh, and that was for the orthodontist who didn't know how to get the teeth there, and they would just cross their fingers and pray that that was going to chew them into occlusion. So so anyway, but yeah, it's uh, it retention is forever. It's forever and ever. So do you think Candid will um, try to do an IPO? I mean, Invisalign stock has been crazy. Um, um, Smalls Drug Club's having a bunch of problems. Um, it's got uh, venture capital backing. What, what is the what is the next move uh, for Candid? You know, C C Candid is, we're, we're very comfortable where we're at, continuing to um, uh, innovate in this space of teledentistry, teleorthodontics creating, uh, you know, our own systems so that we have control over the things that we're doing. Uh, and the, you know, and as, as we walk down this road, I don't, I don't see that on the horizon for us anytime soon, particularly in light of, uh, of what happened with smile direct club. Uh, so, you know, what, what we're wanting to do now is separate ourselves out as the, the, the choice. If you're interested in getting affordable, accessible, quality, safe, clear aligners, and you want to do it in the teledentistry model or in this, you know, our studio model by orthodontist, th that that's who we are, and we want to just keep uh, beating that drum so that uh, as many people in the United States will understand that that's who we are. And, and, and again, being very candid, being very straightforward about, you know, what, what the reality is of treatment, because you, you, you would be surprised the our num number one reason for negative comments on social media are it's for patients that we, that we tell them we can't treat them. That are those are the people that are most upset, and that, that I've never I mean I've never experienced that in private practice before. So it's it's a it's a different if it's a different world. It's a different space. But where, where I was going when I uh, mentioned where you used to uh, have uh, text words on us, I was going to ask you um, of if you did a hundred clear liner cases, how many mm -hmm. of them would be um, tele um, tele dentistry? Uh, teleorthodontics versus uh, seeing the patient physically in person. Oh, when I was at Texas Orthodontics for the last for the last year and a half to two years, I was treating my patients like it was a teledentistry practice. Uh, I would gather the records. I would do the diagnosis and treatment planning. I, I, I would have an in-office consultation with them. I would deliver their liners, and then I would uh, put them on dental monitoring. And I would view their, uh, and here's the good part. I went from 25 team members down to five because the, the, the amount of support that you need when you, when you don't have people, you know, patients coming back into your office every week, uh, it changes the whole, and I had a 19 chair orthodontic practice. So I needed about three of those when I moved into uh, clear aligners and, and the kind of the teledentistry model. So I was doing that before we were doing it at Candid. So um, for Candid, um, one of the VCs is Bobby Goshell, right? Is mm -hmm. that it? Bobby Go is, yeah. Are you friends with him? Do you know him? Yeah. My God, he's uh, he's got the, um, he's with WeWork, Live Candid. Um, 
Um, so what's he? What's he uh, all excited about these days? He he's uh, he's if you if you kind of look at our brand and our look, he's responsible for that because he's the the he's the he's the chief design officer. He kind of gives us the look that we have, the colors, you know, the j- just the whole feel of what that looks like. Um, you know, I, I I'd like to think. And and uh, and and I tell my close friends that I'm a really good orthodontist. <laughs> so, uh, but don't get me into the marketing and into the design because that's not that's not what we do. You know, it's, sometimes we is is uh, as healthcare providers, we sometimes think because we're good at one thing, we're good at everything. Um, again, I'm 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 really good at a, at like one single thing in this whole world. Uh, and I know how to slalom water ski. So there's two things. Oh, my claim to fame is I hold the university record at Southwestern for a hundred yard dash, which I will always hold. Is and your the name Earl is, Campbell? Huh? Is your name Earl Campbell? No, 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 no. Earl, okay. I was actually probably faster than Earl Campbell, but he was a lot tougher than I was. Are you, how are you serious? You're that fast. I, I, I ran, I ran a nine, seven, five hundred yard, yards, not meters. In 1979. Now, I always hold the 100 yard dash record because they do 100 meters now. So nobody will ever beat me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, you know, when, when you're going to a, a college that has a student body of less than 2,500, so nobody really cares. Well, you know what my, uh, my only claim to fame is? What's that? My only record? I'm the yeah. only person on earth who's listened to all 1,294 shows. Of dentistry uncensored. <laughs> nobody, you know what? Nobody You're has stud. done that. You, you, you are incredible. Uh, are you a hunter? You know what? I, you know, not, not much, not much of one. No, I don't. I don't like things dying in front of me. Huh? Okay. Uh, it seems like uh, every time I go down to Texas, it seems like every dentist I meet down there wants to go pig hunting, yeah. deer hunting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, my son, my son is looking for another dad because he he thinks I failed him in that particular arena. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, it, it's so great though. Um, Hey, I just, uh, I, I'm so honored, uh, for you to come on the show today. Uh, I love your, uh, entrepreneurialism. I love it, uh, in, in dentistry. I can only imagine what all the colleagues think. I, I I've seen uh, Scott loon where, um, you know, he tries to do something, um, uh, new and on cutting edge and all that stuff. And, oh my gosh, uh, the, the best way to, um, the best way to not ruffle any feathers is do nothing, say nothing, hide in the basement. And um, my gosh, you're anything but that. I, I remember next door to you. My gosh, you're in Texas. Wasn't he in Arkansas where a dentist, uh, where an orthodontist just wanted to have a hygienist because his yeah. patients were coming in and they, and he thought, why not just have a cleaning? I mean, my gosh, he should have just climbed up on the top of the tree and shot himself. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. That was, I mean, that was like, like he was trying to sell drugs or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know what, our, 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 our profession, um, it can get a little stodgy sometimes. And, um, yeah, entrepreneurs, forward thinkers are not always right. Okay. But we've got to have people who step out of kind of the way things are always being done and, and, and give it a try. And you can, you know, you, you, you may, you may take, you may take the, you know, the death penalty for doing it. Uh, but you know what, we get one chance to go around this life. You've taken a lot of, uh, you've taken a lot of risk going out and doing what you do. I applaud you for that. Uh, you, you kind of keep the conversation in dental medicine, uh, germane and active and alive. And if you weren't doing this, who else would be doing it? Nobody. And I just so, go on, and I can't believe we're we're ten minutes in overtime. I just want to finish one last thing. Um, if you have those entrepreneur things, there's two million dentists in the world, and they all, no matter where you go in in the world, they got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years of college. And Europe has this. Um, you know, America, every state has their own meeting. I mean, fifty states, fifty meetings, national meetings. Europe does one massive meeting every other year in Cologne, Germany. Have you ever gone to that one? 
I have not, but some of my colleagues did this year. I need to go next year. Oh they said it gosh. was incredible. Be because see, see, it's um, see, see, it's a Korean dental company, and they're starting to crush in Korea. Well, they, they don't have time to go to Russia, and Canada, and the United. So there's just people all the time saying, uh, "I'll take the U.S. distribution," and usually the contract they say, "Okay, but." Within, you know, a couple of years, you got to be selling so many dollars a month or we're not going to do it. But what I love the most about that show is it's the same way reason I love um, architecture. It's not like I love a bathroom or a window seal or a door or a church. What I love the, the deal is that, okay, you have to have a bathroom. You have to have a place to go shower and all that kind of stuff like that. And just how they slightly made it different in Germany versus Ukraine versus Pola versus Russia. And it's the same thing about dentistry. You got 8 billion people and only um, um, basically, uh, you know, 2 million, uh, uh, so many dentists. And they are all trying to do the same exact thing, but they all do it slightly different. And I, I was, I remember I was laughing in uh, last time I was there, it was with, I saw Dan Fisher from Ultradent. And I mean, we, we were just like, couldn't believe how all these dentists from Lebanon and Iran and Korea and Brazil, all trying to just like extract a tooth. I mean, they all just want to extract tooth, but they do it a hundred different ways. They do ortho a hundred different ways, blonding, bonding, bleaching, veneers. It is just amazing. Um, I would love, uh, you, I, I can't wait um, until maybe uh, teledentistry starts taking off at the next Cologne. At the last Cologne meeting, it really wasn't about teledentistry, but that is the next frontier. I mean, we all got an iPhone. I mean, I remember with the, when the Motorola flip phone and the Nikea phone were everything. And then in mm -hmm. 2007, all of a sudden, you could see the person you were talking to. And what I can't imagine is um, all the pharmacists in my area, I tell them, when someone comes up and asks you, that, what's the difference between ibuprofen or I got a toothache, should I take Ambisol or should I take Bufferin or this or that? I say, well, pull out your damn iPhone and FaceTime me. And what's amazing is they'll do, my buddy Brad will say, hey, this guy just asked me if he should say Ambisol. I'm busy. Can you talk to him for a second? And he pulls his cheek back and I'm looking at it, it's like I feel like I'm sitting on his lower incisor I I, I can mm -hmm. see and so yeah. teledentistry is gonna be just big it's gonna be the next big thing and uh congratulations for you to being an entrepreneur and climbing the flagpole and letting everyone have a target to shoot at you while you try to pioneer this teledentistry because I think the meaning of life is very simple I mean we live in the present and who built this present? The 108 billion humans who have lived and died before us, uh, represented in your local cemetery. And when I was born, I, I never built an interstate or a dam or a bridge or anything. And those were all presents left by the 110, 108 billion that left uh, that died before us. And the only meaning to your life is that when you die, um, the people that what you leave as a present to the next generation. And I think uh, you mentioned GV Black and you mentioned uh, Pierre Fichard and uh, we're going to leave a lot of really nice presents uh, to our replacement sapiens and teledentistry, telemedicine, uh, teleorthodontics is going to be one of those big, huge gifts. So thanks, uh, Lynn, for all that you do. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. And if you ever uh, want to go... Uh, uh, get some real barbecue in Beeville. You just come down there the next time I'm there cooking. Hey, when you when you come to Beeville, see your grandkids, you have to come. I'll meet you in Beeville, and we'll have that barbecue, or I'll take you to Franklin's here in Austin. Well, if you take me to Franklin's here, you're going to have to take four grandkids. With, uh, be, be, you be, know what? Let's go. All right. It's a deal. All right. Well, I'll be there two that, weeks that, over Christmas, so any, any of that opens up, let's do it. Send me an email. Uh, I, I, I would love to do that. And thank you for your time. And I appreciate the uh, platform. And you're codifying a lot of things in video and audio that uh, that our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren are going to get to be able to 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 uh, review. So thank you. All right, buddy. Have a great day. Okay. Bye bye.